Claudia Cortese's poems have appeared in Best New Poets 2011, Blackbird, Crazy Horse, Kenyon Review Online, and Rattle, among others. And her essays and book reviews have appeared in Mid-American Review and Devil's Lake. Her first book of poetry has been a semi-finalist for prizes from the Crab Orchard Series in Poetry, Persea Books, and the University of Wisconsin Press. A recipient of awards from Rhino Poetry, Baltimore Review, and Kent State University, Claudia lives and teaches in New Jersey. Uh, after the reading, there will be a brief Q&A, so please, while, um, while, uh, while she's reading, make notes, think about things that you want to, think about questions that you want to ask, and afterwards, uh, if you need a signature for class, come up to the front, we'll be here to, to sign the things for you. So, here's cool. Claudia. Okay. Hold your, it's okay, well, it'll work. It's okay. It's okay. Thank you. So we'll, I'll, I'll try to be here for at least a little bit to make sure that there's some projection for the video. Um, so can everyone hear me okay? Yeah? Okay. So um, the first few poems I'm going to read are about this girl named Lucy. I feel like I might just stand here for a little bit. So can everyone hear me even in the back? So they're about this girl named Lucy. And I feel like, so Lucy's this character that I created. And she's an adolescent, 12, 13, 14 years old. And um, she is, she's kind of messed up. <laughs> in a lot of ways, right? So she's, she's got some OCD. She doesn't really have any friends. She's bullied. Her mom is kind of mean to her. She's just like a really kind of screwed up girl. Um, and for me, it was really fun to write from the perspective of this character, uh, partially because I kind of view her as being an amalgamation or a combination of me and my friends when we were that age, because we were all pretty screwed up, um, and partially because I feel like young women are often told to be cute and pretty and sweet, and it's just so annoying, right? All the women in the room, don't you get, kind of get annoyed sometimes by everyone telling you to, be, to smile and to be nice? And Lucy's not very nice. So I love that about her. <laughs> so the first three or four poems are going to be about Lucy. Um, this first one's called Lucy Tells the Boy to Suck. And all of the Lucy poems, their titles are also the first few lines, or the first line of the poem. Lucy tells the boy to suck till her arm pockmarks. That if he stops, she'll expose what happens at playground's edge. Back home, Lucy decks the tree and Barbie heads. Watches snow cut the landscape, all those little white knives. She leaves a hill of jujubes where her mother's ant traps should be. Lucy loves the carmine glory of her arm, the blood medals of a champion. She calls her dog Frankie to her bites his fur till the roots let go. His yelps shine like sequins, the way snow is sequins, and her arms. Lucy demands Santa stitch her a skin of bees, that her screams be not sound but solid, a stinger that stings and stings. So this next one's called Lucy Wraps Salmon. <laughs> Lucy wraps salmon around her fingers, plucks the pink flesh with her teeth. She must wash each hand seven times. She must throw the empty box of wild Alaskan salmon in a bag, wrap it in red, blue, and yellow ribbons. She presses the ready whip nozzle till her mouth fills with sugary relief. Walking down the sidewalk, Lucy waves hello to no one. She counts how long the light stays green. Reaching 20 seconds means her mother will die in a plane crash. The sky with its white pelts, its glittering lid, is always with her. Tulip trees unpucker their lips in the wind. Oh, looks 
like someone's trying to get in. The crowd, they really want to come to my reading. <laughs> so, um, let's see here. Let me see the time. Okay, so the last of the Lucy poems, I have a lot of these, but this is going to be the last one I read, and then I'll read some other stuff. Uh, this is actually a letter that Lucy wrote to me, Claudia. My first name's Claudia. Letting me know what she thinks about the poems that I wrote about her. And keep in mind, Lucy, you know, she's got some mood issues. So she's, she's a little annoyed with my poems. So this is what she, ha what she has to say to me about my poems about her. Dear Claudia, I don't know why you made a broken girl. I bury glass in the moonlight, eat Oreos at midnight, dream my skin abuzz with knives. Give me red hair, tits spry as sprites. Make me a siren on the riverbank, bewitching boys with my liquid song. I'd scissor around them, take what's mine. It's true, I hate my belly fat, hide behind the spruce in gym class. But you don't know why, Claudia. You think I feed worms to my sister, tell her about the six pack rings that strangle sea turtles, because I hate her. To love is to suffer, and to suffer is to give yourself to this world. The sun freckled oak will blacken, night rotting its branches. And this I swear, if you write what happened to me beneath the unlit porch light, I will wrap your veins around your throat. Regards, Lucy. Hope I don't ever actually meet her. I don't think she likes me very much. Okay, so these next, when were most of you born? Most of you were born, I hate, you guys were probably born around 1990, right? 91, 92. Who was actually born in the 80s? Anyone in here? Awesome. Someone born in the 80s. Anyone else? Okay, all of you were born in the 90s. That is scary. I was in high school in the 90s, so I'm, I'm dating myself a little bit. Um, so these next few poems take place in the 90s, during my um, adolescence and teen years, and yes, I wasn't, I wasn't in my 20s in the 90s. I was just a teenager, so I'm not that old. Um, so you're gonna see some reference to some stuff from the 90s. Does anyone here know who Bikini Kill is? Okay, Bobby does. Anyone else here? Awesome, all right. So who's Bikini Kill? Um, they were in 10 Things I Hate About You. Oh, they were? Oh, I didn't know that. That's cool. Okay, so they're like a feminist punk band from the 90s. And they're just really, really awesome. And when I was in high school, I loved them, and so did all my friends because they were so badass. Um, so they're in. Uh, so you know, the speaker in this first poem is wearing a bikini kill T-shirt, and then in the next poem, uh, the speaker mentions the craft. Has anyone here seen the craft? Oh, awesome! Yeah. So the craft is this really, you know, great movie about this coven of teen witches. So what could be better than a coven of teen witches? And then another poem also mentions Headbangers Ball. That's actually the 80s. It's like, it was like this really corny, heavy metal show on MTV that was on at like midnight on Saturdays, I think. So we have some like 80s and 90s stuff going on here. Some of it's before your time, but I also feel like the 90s are really in right now. Like all of a sudden, don't you guys, don't you guys feel like the style of the 90s? There's some nostalgia for the 90s. Maybe I'm wrong. I, I could just be being nostalgic for my own. Lost youth. Okay, so this first one is called Strawberry Boons Holy. Strawberry Boons is this really sweet wine. Has anyone drunk Boons? Anyone had, does it even sell that? So when I was in high school, it, it's what you drank because you didn't really know any better than to not drink Boons. It's like a really gross, really sweet wine that you only drink when you don't know any better. So I didn't know any better. This is called Strawberry Boons Holy. What I know is this. In my sister's basement bedroom, that glazed sea of pot smoke and nose rings, I cradled a bottle of boons between my knees. The room swayed and blurred waves, and I woke to stars, shocking skin. Naked for fishnets and a bikini kill t-shirt are nothing in a Northeast Ohio blizzard. 
I heard wind weird the trees. The air cracked cold. I don't know how my body slipped from the party, landed in a jangle of snow light. When I knocked on the side door, my sister whispered, what the hell are you doing out there? I hugged the small neck of the girl I usually wanted to kill and stumbled in. This next poem is called 1998. So I'm going to read about three more poems, and then I'll be done. 1998. We dulled our eyes. To be pretty was to be good. Our roller skate ambitions, the hokey pokey and pink laces, full glory of couple skate. We wanted our pores to open like mouths, to be witchy and wild as the girls in the craft. We dreamt ourselves lonely, the misunderstood. We, lo excuse me. we loved any bridge over water, any reef marking the highway median. We bought a Ouija at Toys R, at Toys R Us. Ghost girls told us they slept in snow castles, stuck to each other like cobwebs, and death was all shards of orgasm. We planned our suicides, slept in Pop-Tart comas. I think I may, let's see here, it's been about 12 minutes. Maybe I'll just read um, one more poem. Right, and I don't like to go over anything. I like to respect the time limits. So this is going to be my last poem. Um, is anyone in the room Italian? It's New Jersey, so there has to be some Italians in the room. Are you serious? There's no one here who's one person? No? I thought New Jersey was crawling with us. One more? Oh, they're being shy. OK, or at least part Italian, right? There's some lost grandmother, grandfather, <laughs> came over like 100 years ago or something. I don't know. OK, well, I'm, I'm Italian. I'm actually 100% Italian. My parents are both from Italy. Um, and so I grew up um, pretty much spending my school year in, uh, in Ohio. That's where I grew up, was in Ohio. And then, and then my summers in Italy. And um, my grandmother's Italian, obviously, therefore. Um, is anyone here, call, those of you who are Italian, do any of you call your grandmother nonna? Anyone here say some, or something like that? Nonna means grandmother in Italian. Um, so my grandmother died over the summer. And although I was very close to her when I was a kid, the older I got, the more complicated my relationship got with her, which I explore in this poem. And um, when she died this summer, I realized how much I loved her. <laughs> Maybe a little too late. Um, so this is kind of about that, about our complicated relationship. And my dad also makes a cameo in this poem, as do some of my poetry students. I teach poetry at Montclair. OK. Non Erminia, that was her name. Nonna means grandma. Erminia was her first name. Nonna Erminia. I put too much pepper in the stir fry, so I fish the broccoli out. Run it under cold water. Make my meal plain. My grandmother died last summer, and she's in the pot of oil scrimmed water, my ghost face in windows. And I know there are too many dead grandma poems, not enough about the iPod nation. But I called her non Nermina. She lived in Naples. And some days, I hardly remembered she existed. I was busy, and she was rich and racist. A Victorian vase, the old-fashioned lace you forget in a box in the back of the closet. And to love the masses, I had to hate her, though I never could. So I mustered up indifference, a critical distance, and sent her a card saying, I miss you. And when I went to Italy for the funeral, the card was propped on her nightstand. She loved me that much, or so few cards came, or both. 
And what if I loved an idea more than the body? It's charts and maps and not the beloved beside me. Perhaps the one good act in my one small life was to send a card. And what if one day I see the sky's spires, its stones of blue light, and my eyes, screen tired, can't see them, which is to say I see them but can't feel them. Because to see a simple sky with its simple stones, to feel that church inside me, takes practice, which I never tell my students. I want them to know poetry is hard work, to fill the reader with your uglies, your swans, the forks and cul-de-sacs of an Ohio girlhood. And I've never told the truth. The work isn't time, it's the everyday openings. My dad once said, when my father died, I was relieved. And I didn't know what to say. I've tried writing a dozen poems about that day. They all failed. I couldn't imagine his story, hating or fearing or some other something feeling a father so much that when he dies, you don't wake in the night, your teeth in the pillow, glottals clogging and nodding your throat. The day my dad passes, snows will shoot up, the glass fall. I'll be a small girl in a small jar, and it will take all my work to shear a hole. I won't leave the way I came. And that's it. Those are my poems. So should I keep standing here for the key? Yeah, stand. Okay. Oh, thanks. Um, Can I just like kind of look at you guys? But I feel like this is only. Can I just? Oh, oops. Maybe I'll just. Oh, Jesus. Okay. I'm breaking the equipment now. I just kind of want to be closer to you guys and see you guys while answering your questions. So. Let me get a little closer, sorry about that. I am very clumsy. It's surprising that I don't do that at every reading, that I don't trip and fall at some point. You know, I'm kind of like Jennifer Lawrence, clumsy but cute, you know? It's like cute to be clumsy, fall in my dress. Anyway, <laughs> so. Are there any questions? Oh, that was a hand. Do you have a hand in the back? Yeah, please. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk about I love questions, so please ask them. Do you want to, or should I call? Or, yeah, yeah, I don't know who to, yes, you. What, what inspired you to write about, like, I guess a messed up girl who had throws to me and a bunch of issues? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, well, I think part of it is that I was a messed up girl when I was that age, when I was 12. I mean, I was pretty messed up from, like, 12 to 18, I would say, as I think most of us are. Right? But I think that a lot of times the way, I feel like there's kind of like these two polar opposites either that's totally not presented at all and completely repressed, right? And we get these really kind of vanilla and like idealistic views of adolescence. Or the way it's explored is really simplistic. Um, and so I just really wanted to create a character that I felt really sort of conveyed the frustration, the anger, um, the sadness that I felt and that my friends felt when I was that age and in a way that felt true and also in a way that felt like it went against the stereotypes for young women, right? Especially when you're that age, you're starting to come into your sexuality, your body, and you try really hard to be pretty and to smile and to attract boys or all that stupid crap you're supposed to do. And I just did it. I didn't, and I don't think that's actually really true to what it actually is like to come of age in this country as a young woman. I think it's kind of a violent process. So I wanted to just kind of create a character that was not a stereotypical woman or girl and that I felt like really embodied the emotional complexity that I felt at that age. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Kind of. I know that was a very long-winded answer. Um, so. I have a question I could sort of follow up to that. Um, 
So then what made you decide to uh, move those poems from being a poem about Lucy into a dialogue with yourself? You know, that's a good question. And in, in the manuscript, there's also some letters that Claudia writes to Lucy. Um, so, you know, that's a really good question. I think it was, I think almost like her writing a letter to me, I felt like in a way by writing about her in the third person, there was some distance there, right? To say the she is more distant than to say the I. So I think I wanted to move the emotional distance a little closer. I wanted, because by giving her an actual voice, by giving her the I voice, um, I felt like that was empowering her a little bit. And I wanted to kind of give her the space to be upset and to be angry and to really own that in the first person. And then I also wanted to get the chance to respond. And in the book, I respond to her and explain to her why I created her, which kind of answers that young man's question. So I kind of talked about how Lucy was me and Lucy was my sister. I actually have a twin sister. She was my friends. She was the girls in my middle school class. And so I think also I wanted the ability to respond to her um, and therefore also communicate to the reader the significance of Lucy. Yeah. Is Lucy the only character you've ever created? That's a good question. Um, I've created other characters, but I think she's the best one. <laughs> um, I actually, in, in the older version of my manuscript, I had a lot of persona poems. A persona poem is a voice in the character, in the voice of someone else, and the voice of a character. And I ended up cutting a lot of them because they weren't that good. <laughs> so it's OK, right? As writers, any of you who are writers, you end up scrapping lot a lot of what you write. So she's the best. Although I did write in the voice of a witch a few times, a sex worker with blue skin and wings. She was kind of weird, but I did like her. Um, so, but she was the best. She was the best. It is hard to, to write about an, a character. So, yeah. I feel like from what I heard, like uh, the way you write your poems, it's, uh, you know, comparison to like, uh, you know, does a drama like Max Irwin. It's like a, a much more simplistic format. Mm -hmm. uh, do you mm -hmm. find that to be, I don't mean that like an insult. Oh, not I just mean, um, do you find that, that that's a contrast between that and um, if you write short stories, do you find like that's a big contrast and simplistic as, composed, as compared to a, a bit more complex like in yeah. short stories? Right, right. Well, I, I don't write short stories. I've tried, but they're not very good, so I don't do that anymore. Um, well, you know, I, I, I do think that there is something very clear, especially about all the poems I read today. But I will say this, I actually, I tend to choose my clearer poems to read at readings. Because I feel like, so I do have some poems that are more avant-garde, experimental, where there are multiple voices in the poem, and the, the narratives and the settings shift very rapidly. But I didn't read any of those because I feel like they're too hard to follow at a reading. You know, you, so I did choose purposefully to read poems that I love, but that I also thought that maybe would be easier to just hear. But there is something to be said for clarity. Um, sometimes the most chilling you know, work is, is, is written very clearly. But then even though the writing is clear, it still conveys an emotional or intellectual complexity. You know? So but yeah, it's a good question. So I, I, I don't always write this way. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. 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 When you write, do you have like a process? Like do you have to sit down and make yourself write? Or do they just kind of come to you? You know, um, I usually have to make myself sit down and write. I feel like sometimes, and I understand why. I feel like our culture, we sometimes romanticize artists a little. Like they just get stri struck by these lightning bolts of inspiration. And then, you know, it's as if God is moving their hand for them. And they're just, you know, so inspired, which does happen. It does happen every once in a while that way. Uh, but I feel like usually it's like, OK, I'm going to sit down and write from 8 to 9 AM or 6 to 7 PM. And one thing I found that's interesting is that the more I regimen my writing, the more I get myself on a writing schedule, the more likely it is that a poem will kind of just come to me. So there are occasionally moments where all of a sudden a poem just comes to me, and I'm driving, and I have to pull over my car, and I'm writing so fast, and I can't keep up with it. But interestingly, those moments only happen when I'm on a writing schedule. It's kind of like, is anyone here an athlete or anyone here exercise on a regular basis? Like jog, lift weights, elliptical. Let's see a show of hands who does that. You know how when you first start training or you first start working out, it's like hell, and you're so out of shape, and you're so short, <laughs> sore, and then the more you do it, the easier it gets? It's the same thing with writing. The more you write, it's like your brain is like a muscle. And the more you write, 
the more you can write and the easier it gets and the more it's just likely to just kind of come to you. So, yeah. And then How you often that. do you write on a daily basis? Huh? <laughs> Not as much as I should, to be honest. Um, well, I teach. Oh, no. That's uh, okay. I'm going to answer it honestly, even though it's probably. Aye, aye, aye. Okay. Sometimes I go up to like a month without writing, to be honest, or a month and a half, especially when I'm teaching a lot and grading a lot. And Bobby, I'm sure, has experienced this. I sometimes just feel like I don't have the time to write. But then definitely over the summer, I try to take my summers off and over breaks and periods when I'm not grading as much. I do sometimes write um, you know, every day, one to two hours a day, sometimes even three or four. Um, and that's more over the summer um, than during the school year. Sometimes it's just about when I can squeeze it in. And you had a, oh, she had a question back there, and then I'll call on you. I just wanted to know, like, when you were in college or whatever, mm. how did you decide, I want to write? I'm going to, because, I mean, being a writing major, you have to write a lot. It's true. All right, I'm just going to move over, because I feel How like was that good. for you, yeah. having to write constantly? Yeah. So why did I decide to start writing, and what was it like? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I'm going to tell you guys a personal story. Um, when I was 19 years old, and I did start writing poetry in college, so that's, that's cool that you kind of figured that out. One of my friends committed suicide, um, and it was really difficult because I really loved her. And at the very same time, I was in a women's literature class, and Sylvia Plath was assigned. Has anyone here read Sylvia Plath? Oh, that's awesome. You guys have great literature professors. She's amazing. Um, okay, so then. Those of you who've read her, you know, but she, she committed suicide. And a lot of her most intense poems are about why she decided to do it. And I was so grief stricken. And then at the very same time, I started reading Sylvia Plath. And her poems blew me away. Like literally, like the first time I read Lady Lazarus, which is one of her famous poems, I couldn't stop reading it. For about an hour, I just sat there and read it over and over and over again. Because um, I was so blown away. Because I felt like she was she was expressing why she wanted to die, and it was something I wanted to figure out. Why would someone want to die? Um, and then right after that, and it, you know, because I was so grief stricken and because I was so inspired by Plath, I just started writing poems all the time. And I kind of couldn't stop for all of the rest of college. Just took a ton of workshops, um, started reading a lot of poetry. Um, but it was time consuming. But it was a lot of fun, you know, writing workshops. If you're interested in writing, creative writing workshops are so much fun. Um, you know, so does that answer your question? Yeah, and you had a question? Yeah, um, I was wondering when Lucy wrote you that letter, was that how you felt about yourself back when you were 12? Huh. So the way she was talking about herself, about how she was broken and she'd hide behind the spruce in gym class and all that kind of stuff and how she was mean to her sister. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I definitely, I actually failed gym class my freshman year of high school because I refused to change. I would just go and smoke cigarettes and read books. And somehow I never got caught. They probably knew I was doing that, but they were just probably happy I wasn't making a fuss. Um, so yeah, yeah, pretty much, you know, and I was mean to my sister too. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's pretty accurate, yeah. So, you know, I feel, like she, I feel like I kind of wrote that letter too to answer Bobby's question as a way to express all of the anger I had, but then there's also some you know, depth when she says to love is to suffer and to suffer is to give yourself to this world. Because through her suffering, she also was able to really feel connected to the world around her. So yeah, that's pretty much me there. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so besides Sylvia Plath, I mean, um, who are some of your uh, literary influences? Like, who do you enjoy reading? Hmm. Oh, that's such a hard one, because I love so much. Um, well, Sylvia Plath is huge, and then Anne Sexton, who was one of her friends. Do you know who Anne Sexton is? You know, she's, Anne Sexton also committed suicide, <laughs> so her poems are pretty crazy, too. Um, you know, a great contemporary poet that I love is Terence Hayes. If you guys have ever heard of him, he won the National Book Award. He's an African-American poet. His poems are so musical and beautiful. Um, so I highly recommend Terence Hayes. I love Sylvia Plath. I love Anne Sexton. Um, Virginia Woolf, has anyone here read? She was a novelist from the you know, modernism era. I love her for her ability to kind of really shatter and make weird narrative. So she's an experimental novelist. So yeah, those are some writers I love. Yeah. These are such good questions. You guys are awesome. Other questions? Bless you. 
Oh, yeah. Um, I noticed that some, like, the poems that you read out loud were kind of, like, sad. Mm. So you have, like, happier poems. <laughs> well, did you think Strawberry Boone's Holy was sad? The one about getting drunk and then passing out in the well, snow? <laughs> That's really what happened at the poem. Like, or, um, I mean, most of them were pretty sad, it's true, but I thought, did you, what about the other one about the girls who got the Ouija board? Yeah, like, I, well, that's what I mean, too. Like, it's kind of like, have a hairy kind of... Right, because on the one hand, you know, they're, like, going to the roller skating rink and dancing with boys and watching the craft, but then they also want to, like, communicate with spirits, right, and, and maybe kill themselves after they eat their Pop-Tarts. You know, so there is, like, this dark edge underneath the sort of fun. You know what, I feel like... Most of my poems are kind of like that. Even when they're fun and playful, I try to kind of put some darkness in there just because I feel like that's more true to life, right? I mean, yeah, my, my, child, my girlhood was so much fun in some ways, like, you know, going to the roller skating rink, getting drunk, hanging out with boys, whatever. It was fun, but then there was also a lot of darkness and sadness there. So I feel like I, try to, I never try to have it be too happy because then it feels like a Disney movie or something, which, I, which isn't, doesn't really feel true to life. So I always try to like, oh, if this is getting too happy, I got to put a little suicide in there or something. <laughs> or, you know, maybe some witches will fly by. Um, tear some dog's fur out or something. <laughs> so, and maybe it's also because like as a woman, I feel like I've always been told to be like nice and sweet. And I'm like, ugh. So I just kind of want to rebel against that a little bit in my poems. So good question and good observation. Yeah. I guess that seems to be it, right? You guys have any more questions? No? Sure? <laughs> this is like your last chance. If there's something in your head that you want to ask, it doesn't have to be about poetry. Ask about anything. Life advice. Oh. <laughs> I'm not sure they want to take life advice from me. Got one? See? Well, oh, okay. Sure. Oh, okay. That's very. That's a very easy one to answer. Uh, C O R T E S E. It means courteous in Italian, believe it or not. Even though my characters aren't very courteous, my last name does mean courteous. Did that? Yes, C O R T E S E. We have another question. Yeah, sure. Um, how do you react when someone reads your poems and they're like, what's wrong with you because they're dark? Um, <laughs> well, I'm not sure anyone's ever said that to me. But, um, well, oh, I don't know. I guess I'll react to that. Should I pretend that you just said that to me, and then do you want to see my reaction to it? Because I'm not a dark <laughs> poet, but I'm scared to show people because I'm scared about how they react. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Well, you know what? I think I'm lucky in that most of my friends are artists, and most of my fa a lot of my family members are too. My siblings are artists, and my parents are also very creative. So even when I show my parents some of my really dark poems, I still remember like. I gave a poetry reading when I was 22 years old because I won this undergrad poetry award thingy. And so I gave a reading and my parents were there and I read a lot of poems that were like really dark about our family and about some of the trauma in our family. And I remember a couple people, I still remember like my friend told me afterwards that this one professor like whispered to her like, oh my God, her parents are in the audience. Can you believe she's reading these poems? But you know what, my parents didn't care. They were like, the poems were beautiful and we loved them. So like, I'm really lucky that I just come from a place where people are like, write what you want if it's your truth and we'll support it. But then there were other people in the audience who were like, oh my God. You know, because I do think some parents, and I have a friend who's writing a, a book right now that explores some dark stuff in her family and she's afraid that her parents are gonna disown her if she publishes it. So that's a concern for some people. But the nice thing about poetry is you can't just say it's the speaker, right? It doesn't, I mean, poetry is not memoir or nonfiction, so you can kind of hide behind that. So I think it depends on who your family and friends are. Some are gonna get upset if your poems are too dark or too revealing, but I'm lucky. I don't have to deal with that. Yeah. Are you happy now or do you still have a dark side? <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. I actually, you know, I am very happy. And even when I write some of my dark poems, I'm still happy, to tell you the truth. I'm, I'm a very happy person. Liz, who's in the audience, my good friend. Am I happy, Liz? Yes, very. Oh, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm happy. Like, I laugh a lot. I smile. Um, 
but I guess I feel like I go to poetry. Maybe I'm happy because I can say the things I can't say in my everyday life in my poems, because I get to be angry and dark and even sadistic, cruel in my poems. I get to say all of those things that you're not supposed to say in everyday conversation because they're not polite. So the fact that I get to say those things in my poems actually makes me a happier poem person in my day-to-day -day life. And the fact that I, and I do read a lot of dark poets because they let me kind of explore a lot of those things that if I were to try to repress them, I'd probably be more unhappy. It's almost like a, you know what I mean when you like have something that's weighing on you and you talk about it with one of your friends and you feel better afterwards? Yeah, that's kind of what poetry does for me. So I'm, I'm good, you know, I'm not I'm doing well in life. I'm happy. Um, yeah. Um, have you always liked writing? Like you said you started in college writing poems. Did yeah. you, when you were younger, did you think you were going to be doing that? No, no, um, I did not like writing in high school, but I didn't really like anything in high school. Um, so I didn't like it, I just really, I just was so messed up, I didn't like anything. I mean, I liked hanging out with my friends and drinking, um, going to parties, but so it wasn't really until college that I, I discovered writing. And that's when I started to love it. So it was really kind of later. Whereas I have friends who are writers who said they knew in like first grade that they wanted to be writers. But I really and truly believe that you can discover writing at any point in your life. You can be 30 and decide you want to be a writer or 40. For me, it was when I was 19. But I also don't, I don't think I had the emotional and intellectual clarity to write before then because I was so crowded with other things in my life. But um, no. So it wasn't until college that I realized I wanted to write. Yeah. Yeah. So, from my understanding, you kind of like use writing as a venting tool. Like, would you say that that you use writing sometimes to vent? Yes, uh, to vent. But then, yes, I think that when I first started writing, that's how I used it. But now it's become more of an artistic practice, a craft. So let me see how. And I also use it as an intellectual tool. Sometimes if I'm trying to figure out what I think about something, um, if I don't know. Um, like even with my, when my grandmother died, I didn't really know what I thought about her death and then I wrote that poem and then I realized it actually revealed, the poem itself revealed to me a lot of what I thought about it. Um, and so I would say yes, it's a venting tool, but it's also, it's also a way to figure out what I think about things. And it's also artistic. You know, I also love trying to think of the best image to convey an emotion or the most beautiful way to say something. There is a sort of craft to it, like a, a painter or a sculptor or a musician, you know, trying to make a piece of art. Um, but I would say at first it was more venting and then it became a more artistic practice. Yeah. Good question. Good question. Yeah. Uh, does it make you nervous to show people your poetry? Um, any, you mean to read it to an audience or just to show it to my friends? Just or? in general, like when you write, like, do you ever just like not want to show people in case? Like, yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, sometimes it is really nerve wracking to show people my work, especially if, if I, yeah, definitely. Um, there's some poems that I definitely was thinking about reading today, but I didn't, you know, because it, it can be hard to show your work to other people. So yeah, and I, I do have some trusted readers people who are also writers who I've been sharing my work with for years. And it's always good to have those people because you need to find, so for those of you who are writers or thinking about becoming writers, I would say the most important thing is to find a couple people that you feel like are good readers, good critics, and who also you feel safe with to show your work to. Um, because it's so important to get that feedback and also just to have someone who's willing to read it. Because I, I couldn't show it to just anybody. I have my few readers and, uh, and that's it. I don't like, I wouldn't show it to people I don't know that well, so, yeah. Although I do publish a lot, but that's different because I don't have to see the people. It goes into a magazine, you know, and I don't have to ever interact with anyone who's read it. <laughs> so. yeah. Good question. Okay, we should probably wrap up. Yeah, such good questions. Thank you for being so attentive. Uh, I feel so honored. And thank you for all of your wonderful questions. I'm grateful.